The Massachusetts Humane Society founded the first lifeboat station at Cohasset, Massachusetts. The stations were small, shed-like structures. They'd hold the rescue equipment that was to be used by the volunteers in the event of a wreck. Now, the stations, however, were only near the approaches to busy ports, so large gaps of coastline remained without life-saving equipment. Now, after the passage of the Newell Act, the federal government allocated $10,000 to build and outfit life-saving stations along the New Jersey shore. Now, Massachusetts Humane Society also applied for and received funding to build life-saving stations along its coastline. Now, during the mid-1800s, these stations were all manned by volunteers similar to the volunteer fire department system. But the system was not very efficient. Dr. Dennis L. Noble's article, A Legacy, the United States Life-Saving Service, stated, one town, in fact, used its lifeboats alternately as a trough for mixing mortar and a tub for scalding hogs. The service limped along as political patronage dumping ground until 1871. Then, a young lawyer from Maine was appointed the head of the Treasury Department's Revenue Marine Division. Summer Increase Kimball was not your average political appointee. Before he accepted the position, he told Treasury Secretary George S. Boutwell, Mr. Secretary, I shall accept your offer upon one condition. If you will stand by me after I have convinced you that I am right, I shall attempt to bring about the reforms you desire. But I want to warn you that the pressure will be tremendous. Congressmen will be coming to you in long processions and will attempt to convince you that I am wrong and that the service is being ruined. It will require an uncommon display of backbone on your part, but if you will stand firm and refer all complaints to me, I promise you that I shall put the service where you want it and where it ought to be. Now, Secretary Butwell required, uh, replied, I shall support you. No matter what the pressure may be, I shall not interfere. Secretary Boutwell was true to his word. Kimball set about reforming the service. His first act was to appoint Captain John Fonts, USRM, to inspect every station and ascertain the current state of the service. During the next four months, Captain Fonts inspected every life-saving station, all the apparatus in the station, and evaluated the men manning the station. On August 9, 1871, he submitted his report. He concluded, Most stations were in dilapidated conditions and too remote from one another to coordinate effectively. Most were in need of extensive repairs, while others had become irreparable. Apparatus had rusted, and at some stations, indispensable articles as powder, rockets, shot lines, and shovels were not to be found. Elsewhere, it was discovered that every article that could be plundered and carried off had been. The keepers at the station were not in much better shape. Several were either too old or lived too far from the situation to carry out their duties properly. Few of them were competent in launching and beaching a small ocean open boat through the heavy winds and surf. Politics had more influence on their appointments than their practical ability. Significantly, the employment of crews at alternative stations had resulted in placing crews where there, were, there was often relatively less need for them, raising the air of the faithful volunteers at the intervening station. Kimball immediately set to work remaking the life-saving service. Now, the average distance between stations was reduced to approximately three miles, and a primary system of signals was established by which one station could summon the aid of its neighboring station. Patrol systems were introduced whereby surfmen would patrol the beach from their station to about the halfway point between stations in all weather conditions. One problem that was not easily fixed was a surf boat. No surf boat could be found or designed that could be launched effectively from the beaches. As the Special Commission met at Seabright, New Jersey in May of 1872 and recommended a cedar surf boat with modifications, then in general use by the wreckers on the coast of New Jersey. 
Now all boats supplied to the station along the Atlantic coast in the next few years were constructed upon this model. In January of 1873, regulations governing the LSS were promulgated. Stations were grouped into districts managed by civilian superintendents and under the jurisdiction of an inspector of the Revenue Marine. The new regulations specified in detail the duties of each individual connected with the service and established a systematic method for the investigation, maintenance of the station. Physical examinations and general requirements for keepers were set up to ensure that only capable men entered the service. Instruction for drill and the use of apparatus, rules for managing open boats in the surf, and in beaching them. Instructions for rescuing drowned, drowning persons by swimmers to their relief. Directions for restoring the apparently drowned. Instructions for care of shipwrecks, victims, and protection and disposition of property falling under the LSS responsibility. And a comprehensive set of forms and procedures for daily record keeping and reporting by stations were also established during Kimball's second year of administration. Now, the life savings uh, stations were crewed by keeper, a keeper, an assistant keeper, and surfman. The primary job was to keep watch out to sea and warn of ships that might be getting close to shore and in danger of running aground on the shoals or the sandbars. This was done with a cost and signal flare. A man was constantly on duty in the watchtower scanning the oceans for ships. Patrols were set up along the beach. A surfman would patrol between his station and halfway to the other station. He would exchange a token with the surfman from the other station to prove he did his patrol, then return to his station. Now this was done at night and during inclement weather. During the day, someone was always on watch to warn ships of danger. Training was rigorous, Monday through Saturday. Mondays, the surfman drilled uh, with the gear for use during the rescue from the beach. Then Tuesday, it was boat drill. Surf boats and lifeboats would be launched and then recovered. The men would also exercise offshore with the oars. Now during warm weather the surfmen would perform capsizing drills practicing the procedures for riding an overturned boat. Wednesday's signal drill. The men practiced with signal flags, semaphores, night rocket signals, and handheld flares. Thursday a repeat of Monday's schedule. Friday first aid drill. Saturday routine maintenance of the station, you know, Painting, repairing, lawn work, cleaning. All men took turns in the kitchen cooking and cleaning. Sunday was the day off, but the men had to stay within hearing distance of the alarm bell. All men had to be back at the station by sundown. The daily schedule of men at a life-saving station was, to say the least, monotonous. The monotony was only broken by the fear and sheer terror of a rescue. Dennis Nobles explained the rudimentary forms of life-saving used by the service in his book, A Legacy of the United States Life Saving Service. Now, there is also a great website uh, on the history of the U.S. Life Saving Service. So, the information came from both of these um, sources. Now, the U.S. Life Saving Service has two means of rescuing people on board ships stranded near shore by boat and by a strong line stretched from the beach to the wrecked vessel. Surf boats were pulled by six surfmen with 12 to 18 foot oars. The surf boat was pulled on a cart by the crewman or horse to a site near a wreck and then launched into the surf. When a ship wrecked close to shore and the seas were too rough for boats, another mess method was employed. Uh, the Lyle gun propelled the line to the ship. Now the Lyle gun could shoot its projectile up to about 600 yards. The projectile carried a small lighter line, which the shipwrecked sailors would then pull out the heavier line. Once the line was secured, a life car could be pulled back and forth between the wreck and the safety of the shore. The life car was heavy and difficult to use. An easier method was the breeches buoy. Now, a breeches buoy was a life preserver ring with canvas pants attached. It could be pulled out to the ship by, pull, uh, by pulleys the endangered sailor got into the life ring and pants and then he was pulled back to safety. Besides having to pull the surf boats on a cart, the surfman also had to pull the beach apparatus cart. This carried the, all the equipment needed to set up the breeches buoy. The 
service was becoming highly specialized force in the saving of sailors and shipwrecks in distress in 1899. New regulations were established concerning actions at a wreck. Article 4, Actions at Wreck, Section 252, is how the unofficial model of the Life Saving Service and the U.S. Coast Guard came about. The regulation stated, In attempting to rescue, the keeper will select either the boat, breeches buoy, or life car, as in his judgment is best suited to effectively cope with the existing conditions. If the device first selected fails after such trials as satisfies him, then no further attempt with it is feasible, he will resort to one of the others, and if that fails, then to the remaining one. And he will not desist from his efforts until by actually trial, the impossibility of effecting a rescue is demonstrated. The statement of the keeper that he did not try to use the boat because the sea was too heavy will not be accepted unless attempts to launch it were actually made and failed, or unless the confirmation of the coast as bluffs, precipitous banks, etc., is such as to unquestionably preclude the use of the lifeboat. Coast Guard's Historian Office published this account in their frequently asked questions about how the unofficial model, motto came into use. A letter to the editor of the old Coast Guard magazine written by Chief Boson's mate Clarence P. Brady, United States Coast Guard retired, published March 54, page 2, stated, Now the first person to make this remark was Keeper Patrick Etheridge, Brady knew him when both were stationed at the Cape Hatteras Life Saving Station. Brady tells the story as follows. A ship was stranded off Cape Hatteras on the Diamond Shoals, and one of the life saving crew reported the fact that this ship had run ashore on dangerous shoals. The old skipper gave the command to man the lifeboats, and one of the men shouted out that we might make it out to the wreck, but we'll never make it back. The old skipper looked around and said, The Blue Book says, We've got to go out, and it doesn't say a damn thing about having to come back. As the letter stated, the man who said that was Keeper Patrick Etheridge, the first African-American U.S. Life Saving Service station commander. He was a legend in the service, and his station earned the reputation of one of the tautest on the Carolina coast, with its keeper well known as one of the most courageous and ingenious lifesavers in the service. Captain Etheridge ran the P. Island Life Saving Station in Rodanth, North Carolina, located in the Outer Banks, also known as the Graveyard of the Atlantic. P. Island Station was built in 1878. Keeper George C. Daniels was in charge of the station, called Number 17, on the fateful day of November 30th, 1879. The schooner M. E. Henderson had run aground sometime in the early morning hours. There were only three survivors. Keeper Daniels filed a false report about the rescue. This report was placed in the United States Life Saving Service Annual Report for 1879. The three survivors from the wreck came forward and contradicted the report. They said they had to rescue themselves and then walk to the life saving station where they found all the personnel asleep. An investigation ordered by Kimball discovered the truth. Daniels had covered up the facts, lied about the whole rescue. Now for his dereliction of duty, Kimball ordered Daniels to be court-martialed. The findings of the court-martial did not go well for Daniels. Kimball dismissed Daniels from the service and fired all the surfmen at the station. Now, the men who conducted the investigation were Lieutenant Charles Shoemaker and Lieutenant Frank Newcomb. Both men recommended Etheridge to be promoted from number six surfman of Bodie Island Station to keeper at Pea Island. Surfman six was the lowest rank in the service. This was unheard of. Shoemaker's written recommendation stated, Etheridge is 38 years of age, strong, robust physique, intelligent, and able to read and write sufficiently to keep the journal of the station. He is one of the best surfmen in this part of North Carolina coast. The report concluded, I am aware that no colored man holds the position of keeper in the life-saving service, and yet such as our surfmen are found to be among the best on the coast of North Carolina, I am fully convinced that the interest of the life-saving service here in point of efficiency will be greatly advanced by this appointment of this man to the keepership of Station 17. Richard Etheridge was appointed January 24, 1880 as keeper of Station Number 17. 
Now, Etheridge was born into slavery in the Outer Banks area, which is probably where he learned his knowledge about tides, weather, and shore life was learned. Now, he was taught to read and write by his owner, which was against the law in many of the southern states at that time. When the Civil War started, he enlisted in the Union Army. Etheridge was eventually promoted to officer in the colored troops of the Union Army. Now, Etheridge knew what he was up against. Many of the white serpent refused to serve under him. Because of this, Pea Island Station Number 17 became the only fully manned African-American life station in the service. But shortly after Etheridge took command of the station, it was burnt to the ground. May 29, 1880, a month after the end of the active season, the crew had left on April 30th. The station was destroyed by a suspected arson fire. The stable and woodpile located a short distance from the main building survived the fire. So the stable was converted into temporary quarters for the surfmen at the start of the next active season. Etheridge was not a man thrown to throw the towel in. Treasury Department offered a reward of $300. No one ever claimed the reward. The department investigators suspected the surfmen living on Bodie Island, but the case was never prosecuted. No one was ever charged with arson. Now, undoubtedly, the act was done by the local KKK. Captain Etheridge was not the type of man to be intimidated. Kimball ordered the station rebuilt, and Etheridge supervised the rebuilding to his exacting standards. Now, the officers and men of Life Saving Service knew the caliber of Etheridge. There was no finer surfman or keeper in the service at that time. He developed rigorous life-saving drills that enabled his crew to tackle all life-saving tasks. Etheridge realized one mistake by him or his men would mean the end of Pea Island as an all-African-American station. Today, a segregated station would never be allowed, but back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, this type of station was actually a major achievement for African-Americans and equality. His enemies were not from within the service, but from the politicians. All they needed was one excuse to remove Etheridge. He was determined to not let that happen. His first task was to bring discipline and order to the station. He trained his men with military precision, making sure they knew their jobs and the jobs of the other surfmen. This training and high standards set by Captain Etheridge earned the Pea Island Station and Etheridge the reputation, as said before, one of the tautest on the Carolina coast. Captain Etheridge's efforts paid dividends. Etheridge was a natural leader at the station and in the black community, and on October 11, 1896, Etheridge's rigorous training drills proved to be invaluable. The three-masted schooner, the E.S. Newman, was caught in a dangerous storm. The, Kuno, the schooner was en route from Providence, Rhode Island to Norfolk, Virginia. The storm blew the vessel 100 miles off course and came ashore on the beach two miles south of Pea Island Station. The storm was, was so severe that Etheridge had suspended normal beach patrols that day. The patrols were suspended, but not the watch from the station. Surfman Theodore Meekins saw the first distress flare, and he immediately notified Etheridge. Etheridge gathered his crew and launched the surf boats. Battling the strong tide and sweeping currents, the men struggled to make their way to the point opposite the schooner, only to find there was no dry land. Etheridge picked two of his strongest surfmen and tied them together and connected them to the shore by a long line. These two men fought their way through the roaring breakers and finally reached the schooner. The P. Island crew members made their way through that crashing surf and breakers ten times and rescued the entire crew of the E.S. Newman. It would be years later that Captain Etheridge and his crew would be recognized for their effort that day. Captain Richard Etheridge was a man who took to heart and understood what it takes to save lives on the sea when he told one of his surfmen, the blue book says we've got to go out and it doesn't say a damn thing about having to come back. The number of lives Etheridge and his crew saved is estimated to be around 200 people, but it would take 100 years and an inquiry to the United States Coast Guard Office of the Historian plus a letter from a little girl to Senator Strom Thurmond before Captain Etheridge and his entire crew were recognized for the heroic action that day. In October of 1896, for their efforts,
the crew of the Pea Island Life Saving Station, Richard Etheridge, Benjamin Bowser, Dor Pugh, Theodore Meekins, Lewis Westcott, Sidney Weiss, and William Irving were awarded the Gold Life Saving Medal on March 5, 1996. So, what is the takeaway from this story? Well, it just takes one man with determination and vision to change a corrupt system. That man was Sumner Increase Kimball. And a person who is determined to make it will make it no matter what the obstacles. Captain Patrick Etheridge's belief in his ability, pride in his station, and his crew proved that point. This is our history. This is our heritage. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and ring the bell to be notified every time I post new content. And share this video with your friends if, they, if you think they might like it. Eternal Father, Lord of hosts, watch our love and who guard our coast. Protect them from the raging seas and give them life. Grant